everyone. It is Bible study time. Yay! Always excited about coming forward with a thought-provoking Bible study for you all. And today is no different. We are in the book of Matthew today. We're in chapter 17. I'll be reading from uh, verses 15 through 21. Excited about uh, what God is going to do today. I'm just ex excited to see how God decides to move as I'm sure you all. So you all are. So let's get moving along with uh, invoking the spirit of God and helping me in the discernment of God's word. Heavenly Father, I come before you looking for you throughout the many pages of this book. I ask that you move freely in this space, Father. Find all energies that are, that are not in agreement with your movement in this space. Protect this space. Lessen me and magnify you. I love you and I thank you. In God's name I pray, amen. All right, y'all. Okay, so chapter 17, verse 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Hallelujah, y'all. Okay, so uh, Jesus is, you know, he's he's empowered his disciples, as we've already spoken to in the previous Bible studies. He's multiplied himself among the disciples. Jesus knows that once he begins to really show his power, the people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees are going to wage war against him. They're already looking for a reason. The people love him. They need to find a reason. They can't, so they 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 watch him closely. And, you know, in watching him closely, they look like they're supporting him, but they're micromanaging his every move. They're looking to catch him up on technicalities, stuff that don't even matter. They're parading themselves as if they are on the side of God, but truly they are on the side of Satan and they, they cannot show it because they will lose the support of the people. The people are the power source. They are, they are needing to direct the people. They are needing the support of the people because without the people, the game would be over. There wouldn't be a game. So they position themselves in a light that they look like they're all on the same team. But Jesus knows that they're not. And Jesus knows the corruption at hand more than the people. Because a lot of times, friends, we as people, we don't, a lot of us don't see the big picture. A lot of us are cool with just dealing with the results of things that let us continue living the way we choose to live. And as long as we're comfortable, we're cool. Jesus knows this. This is the same thing going on in this in, in Jesus' time. So Jesus knows that he must multiply himself amongst the people. Because if he doesn't, then they could completely stop what Jesus came to do. 
They could stop it by removing Jesus. But if Jesus is able to multiply himself amongst his 12 friends, why did Jesus need 12 friends, 12 new people? Why couldn't Jesus pull from his network of people that he knew throughout his life? Well, I just told you in the last Bible study or even on the last podcast or the podcast before that Jesus couldn't pull from his tribe of people, the people that he grew up with, because they they couldn't accept what he matured into. They couldn't accept the level of anointing God had put on, on Jesus. They still had the image of Jesus as Jesus from the neighborhood. They wrestled with accepting him for what he truly was and what he truly ascended to because maybe they hadn't ascended to that. A lot of times we surround ourselves with people because of comfort, because they know us, we have a history with them. And we're like Gideon hiding our successes amongst these people because we don't want them to feel some kind of way about it. We're like Jesus when he went to his hometown and he came around people that knew his family, that knew of him from when he was young, yet he was not able to do any miracles amongst them people. He did phenomenal things amongst strangers. He was powerful amongst strangers. He was accepted. Strangers had more faith in him than the people that knew him from when he was young. How many of us are dealing with that? How many people have businesses or creative ventures that you're looking to offer to the world, yet you, you offer them to the people that are amongst you and you don't get the response that you know you would get elsewhere and you allow it to defeat you mentally? Yet if you were to go outside of that environment, you'd be met with optimism. You'd be met with uh, love and the ability for someone to take a, a chance on even believing what you have to offer is relevant. Whereas the people that you grew up with, the people that knew you well, won't even give you that, that type of grace. So Jesus is dealing with 12 disciples that he's multiplied his strengths through. He's shown them how to heal people. He's not just a healer. All of his disciples know how to do the same thing. He's shown them the science of this thing, the spiritual science. He, he's trained them in the art of how to keep this power active, the rules to this. He's blessed them with things that Prophets of old that have come before him wish they had. He's blessed them with knowledge that the prophets of in Moses' time, in Isaiah's time, in, in Elijah's time, Ezekiel's time, all, all those past times, those there were many prophets during that time that wish they had a Messiah that could come upon them and give them a blueprint, a step-by-step -step blueprint that could walk them through it. Save them time. Give them a, a, a guide, a go-to guide that you can bounce ideas off of instead of having to go through the trial and error scenario that all of the great ones had to go through. Yet, even then, they struggled with faith. This text is speaking to that. This man has a sick child that the prophets have come, that he has, he has besought the prophets to help cure. And they have come, and there's 12 prophets. There's, there's 12 disciples, rather. And I don't know if all of them tried to cure them, tried to cure this man's son because the text says that the man brought him to the disciples. It didn't say how many. So it's fair to say that all of them knew of this man and his sick child. 
And Jesus is thinking in his mind after the man says it, he says, and I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. And now Jesus is saying to himself, you brought this man to all 12 of my brethren, of my sons, basically, that I have poured all of my knowledge into, that have me with them step by step that they could actually come to and get a real live answer to a problem from. And none of them could cure this child. And Jesus is saying now he's upset. He's saying, oh, faithless and perverse generation. You're a bunch of fake, faithless perverts. That's Jesus said that. He said, you faithless perverts, how long shall I be with you? You think you got me forever? Oh, you want to take advantage of the fact that I'm here? I just told you in two chapters before this that all the great ones wish they had what you have. Oh, so now you want to take advantage of the fact that I'm with you. You're not paying attention. You're not studying. You're falling back and you're allowing yourself not to really go in as much because you think I'm going to always be with you. How long shall I suffer you? He said, bring them to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of, out of him and the child was cured in that same hour. But this is, this is where it got me a little bit. Well, I'll keep reading. And then the disciples and uh then then came the disciples to Jesus and said, Why could we not cast him out? Isn't that just like some staff, people that you didn't train, people that you have working with you? They'll keep it amongst themselves, the problem, amongst the 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 one another or the staff. And then once you get wind of it, you somebody comes directly to you. And they say, you know, I'm having this problem and uh, all of the managers and everybody, no one could solve it. And I know it's simple. I'm wondering just like everybody else, why they couldn't solve it. So I'm coming to you. And Jesus is saying, you mean to tell me I've invested all this time in training y'all? I'm training you for you. These skills that I'm giving you, you can take anywhere. These are not going to do nothing but bless you. And you're not eating it up. You weren't able to solve this simple problem. And then after that, after he, after you fix the problem, after Jesus heals the child, after you fix the problem, here come everybody, the managers and all them that were supposed to know how to do this. And they say, why could we not cast him out? Why couldn't we? We tried everything. Why? And Jesus says, because you don't believe. It's fundamental. This is not rocket science. God created this system in a way that is blatantly simple. God is so smart. It takes wisdom to make something very Difficult to create a system that could be very difficult if you view it in the wrong lens. Made simple to you. You know somebody knows something if they can simplify the complex. If you know someone knows something complex if they can simplify it. Make it so that even a child can understand. And that is how God has set up our system. You do not need a degree. You do not need a degree in mathematics. You do not need a degree in chemistry. You do not need a degree in physics. You don't. You need to know the laws of yourself. And the fundamentals to the to self is knowing. He says, 
because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder, move from here to there. And it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. That's power. That one, is that a sentence or a paragraph? Because I'm looking to see if there's a period in here. That one sentence, that elongated sentence is powerful. He's saying, if you have the faith, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, if you got even a little bit of faith, and you stick to that faith and you do not falter from it. You got to be obstinate. You got to be, I'll be danged. I'm stuck on this. If you have that, that thing got to change. That thing got to move. Jesus said this. Jesus didn't say it's going to happen tomorrow. He didn't put a timetable on it. He said, with well, this recipe, this recipe, even with a little bit of faith, if you are determined, if you're obstinate, friend, if you are staunch, sometimes you got to be staunch. If you are staunch in the fact of whatever you are staunch about and you stay in that place consistently and do not let your faith falter do not let your knowing falter not on good days not on bad days that must always stay consistent regardless to what goes on amongst you that thing has to change no matter how long it takes and a lot of times, friends, the things that take a long time are because we're teetering off of it. We're, our faith is not strong enough. Even though Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a grain of mustard. So he's saying, even with the least amount of faith, this recipe works. Just imagine if you was adamant. Imagine if you had a gallon of that same kind of faith with a gallon of those mustard seeds. And we've all seen how small a mustard seed is. A gallon of them. That thing got to move quickly. And then he goes and he says, how be it? This kind goeth not out by prayer. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And I thought about that and I said, okay, it took me back to verse 17. I'm sorry, it took me back to verse 18. And it said, and Jesus rebuked the devil and, de and he departed out of him and the child was cured in that very hour. So it goes back to what's going on. This child was, was um, had a demon in, inside of him. How did a child get a demon in him? I took, I, I told you just in my uh, uh, video yesterday on my podcast about how, People before the flood were even children were invoking demons. It was becoming a generational thing for the people to teach their families the sciences of working with these spirits. All because of finding comfort, finding some form of stability due to the curse. So they were looking for a way around the curse that God had put on man and woman. Because it still had to be here. So life still had to go on. So in, 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 in life going on, the, the, the fallen ones that started this have presented themselves as a solution to the problem that they created. And said, I can help you with this. Yes, God cursed you. We cursed too. Let me help you. And in doing so, I need you to do this for me. 
and it became rhythmic. It made sense. It was the way of life. It was a new way. And the people had begun justifying it. And they started seeing a result from it. Crops were growing. Birth rates were up. Women were able to have babies and not... It, the, 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 the death rate of women having children went down. They saw a positive result from it. Even though it was corrupting them. It became normal for them. And so they passed this knowledge down so much so that the children were brought up in it. This child has a devil in it. It's possessed. And Jesus has imbued all of his disciples with the knowledge of how to cast out these unclean spirits. How to heal the sick. How to do all of his miracles. We, we, we. Jesus also even took them as far as had them come out and walk on water with them. He's showing them in a first person perspective that all these things I'm doing, you can do. It's like some, it's like you swimming. I'm, you're, you're a master swimmer and you out there giving people swimming lessons. And then one day comes that you go to someone's house and they got a 17 foot pool. There's no shallow end. Everything's 17 foot. Ain't no noodle. There's no life jacket. There's no uh, tire thing, tool thing. Nothing to help you. You must depend on your knowing. And Jesus is out there swimming and all kind of stuff. And, and, and you see Jesus and you're like, okay, I want to swim too. And Jesus is like, come on, use what I told you. No, I need you to know who are you? You're the son of God. We share the same father. This ideology is a fact. It works in every scenario. Use that scenario in this water. And they began swimming and they, they started, they're like, okay, I got it. I got it. And then. They start to lose faith. Jesus starts to swim off and, and do his thing. And, and they see and Jesus swim off and they're losing faith because Jesus is not in enough proximity to really help them if they need it. They were fine a moment ago when Jesus was right there. But now it's like, okay, I'm... And here comes Jesus. You will such little faith. Where is your faith? How, how long do I need to have these training wheels on you? How long? You need to start activating. I'm not going to always be here with you to babysit this. But. So, so this is why Jesus is here. And Jesus is casting out the demon is because the disciples couldn't do this mundane task. Jesus is like, this is fundamental, y'all. I mean, if anything you get, you need to get this because this is the primary problem amongst the people. This is very important. And the fact that none of you could have done it is concerning. And so let me do it. And this, this is where it got me. It says here. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured in that very hour. But then when you go down to verse 21, it says, after Jesus chastised them and after Jesus tells them that they don't believe. And he gives them the analogy of the mustard seed. Jesus says, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So Jesus is telling them, I told you how you must maintain yourselves as my disciples. You got to always be ready. Friend, it's a rap artist, y'all. It's a rapper. His name is Sugar Free. I'm from California, so we love Sugar Free in California. Sugar Free said, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. If you stay ready, you do not have to get ready, friend. When you stay ready, you ready. Because a lot of times, situations show themselves 
when you least expect them. And you ain't got to go, got time to go home and get this and get that and, and, and do this and do that. You got to be ready. This is what Jesus is saying to them. Jesus is saying, the fact that none of you were able to cast this demon out, all 12 of you, none of you were able to cast this demon out. And me, I was, and I wasn't even prepared for this person to come upon me. This person came upon me and found me in the middle of me doing something else. And I was able to heal this person in that very hour. The, the text says, and the child was cured from that very hour. So Jesus is telling them without saying it that the reason you could not cast out this demon is because this demon is only cast out by prayer and fasting. And that tells me none of you have been adhering to the level of prayer and fasting that you must adhere to to be a vessel of God in the earth. You wasn't ready. None of you were ready. Yet they, this, this man comes upon me and I hadn't even heard, known of this. And I was able to do this simple thing within the same hour. Because I was ready. I'm dedicated to this. This is not a pastime. This is not a popularity contest. I'm not out here trying to be popular. I am dedicated to this. I am focused on this. This is what I do. This is a lifestyle. And this, this rings true to many aspects of life today. A lot of things that we suffer from, we suffer because of dedication. Friend, I'm here to tell you, I know what it's like to get distracted. The enemy has, uh, the enemy, myself, what, I'll, I'll take the blame. I allow myself to get distracted. For whatever the reasons is, whether the, whether they're, in my mind, they're all good intentions, but it don't matter. It don't matter. The end, at the end of the day, I'm distracted. No matter how disciplined I might be in my spiritual walk, there are things that distract me. And this is a weakness. Yet, in the distraction, even in the distraction, friend, you must have the faith. You must have the knowing. Surely the distraction will take you off into the wilderness and you'll spend a season there. But it's better to spend a season in the wilderness wilderness knowing a thing that knowing that regardless to how long I stay in this season, everything is going to be fine. Because there are pillars in my house of knowing that are non-negotiable, that I know that I, I am not blowing back and forth on. So sure, there are things that we all can improve upon because nobody over here is, is out here walking on water, friend. We None of us have our own personal Jesus in the physical that we can run it by immediately and get an answer from like that. So we all spend a season in the wilderness. But when you are in your wilderness seasons, which we all will be, you must lean on your knowing. You must lean on things that you have found consistent. Things that make you you. Because without the knowing, anything can come and uproot you. Anything can come and blow you, child, blow your whole house down. Blow your whole house down. 
And that is the analogy I have for you today. There are so many directions that I could gone, could have gone in this parable, sitting here looking at these red and black letters on the white background of this paper. Sitting here reading these words, these red and black letters on the white background of this paper that we find nowhere in the Bible. but from the words of Jesus. And he's dropping nuggets everywhere you look. All of the nuggets that he's dropping are telling you the power that is within you. He didn't come forward to tell you that he's better than you and he has a stronger relationship with God than you and 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 you you're not worthy. He's the only one worthy. That is not what he's saying to you. He's saying the total opposite of that. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is within you. Period. That you are heirs to a mighty promise. Yet you don't know what you have. And you must build yourself up incrementally on solid ground. Because the stony rock is not solid rock. The stony rock will come and winds will come upon you. Your little seed that's branching out, it will come and it'll choke it. It, it. it won't last because you're not built on solid ground. There's no goodness of your soil. Your knowing. All of those experiences and leaning in on God and seeing how God moves is a knowing that creates a richness that makes your soil rich. So nothing but goodness and bountifulness can spring up from it. A hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. <sighs> this is my Bible study tonight. With faith. Just faith of a little faith. Faith of a mustard seed. You can tell a mountain to move and it ain't got no choice but to do it. Might take it a while. But if you multiplied that faith, you had a gallon, a gallon of, of them little mustard seeds of faith. How fast would that thing move? It don't have a choice. You have the power. And your power is in your knowing. What do you know? Not what you hope. Because, friend, I'm telling you, things will come upon you and they will test your knowing. And you're going to either cower out, hide away, beg and plead, or you're going to stand and say, no, uh-uh, no, no. I know like I know like I know like I know. And even if you do cower away and you hide away, friend, I'm here to tell you, God will send you through situations in your life to build you up because you are of a courageous house. And these are the ways of those that are of this house. It is to build you up so that you get to a place where when that situation or, or those situations come upon you, those tests come upon you, that you don't fail them again. You remember. Oh, I failed that last time. I was, a, I was ashamed of that. How could I do that? I didn't know any other way to do it. I'm going to do better next time. How do I get myself better? Because they're going to come again to test you. This is a school, third grade. And you get out of it what you give within it. Jesus came because many were not passing the third grade, friend. Jesus came when 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 the when the woman came and uh the Canaan woman came and asked him to um to help her daughter who was suffering from another devil. 
Everybody's got these demons in them. I know y'all don't want to believe me, but this is, this is, look, you go look up, look it up. People are, were possessed because this was a big deal. It still is. And when she came upon him and asked him to help her in getting this de demon out of her child, he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he made it very clear. That's the second time. He made it clear. His intentions. I come forth for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not because of any kind of racist connotation or any type of a dis difference that he wants to make amongst people because of skin color and ethnicity. But because these children are lost. They're wandering. They're sleepwalking. He came to resurrect the dead. He came to awaken them. Because they were the main ones sleepwalking. I told you before, and I'm not going to get all into it, as to how all these nations saw the greatness of God's hand over these children. What God did for the house of Israel hadn't been done. The children in their walk was new. Nobody honored one God. It was unheard of. It was blasphemous. They should have been able to overcome these children. They were the minority. In the world of the majority, everybody in the world honored multiple gods. So for these small group of people to grow into the, to the nation that they grew in, to, and honor only one god, the Moabites and all the rest of them had to bow down. They turn, God turned Egypt upside down for these children. You got to know what's going on here, y'all. Just for these children. I'm going to give you one more and I'm going to end it. Chapter 18, verse 11. For the son, of, for the son of man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doeth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, and verily I say to you, he rejoiced more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. He's saying, you love so much. That God has made it his business to watch over you. That the least of you is more important than the totality in a way. That he will take his eye off of the whole group just to go and get one of you. Remember David and the lion, y'all. David is out there pasturing the sheep and the lion came and took one of his sheep. And the king went and wrestle with them. He didn't have time to go get a shovel or a stick. He got after them. And, no, you can't have that. Because if he would have wasted any time to go get a get help or go get a, a tool, the lion would have devoured the sheep. Takes the lion no time to kill a sheep. So the king had to get after it immediately. He had to take action then. And he wrestled the sheep out of the mouth of the lion and the sheep lived. And if you know anything about nature, you know that he must have really did some wrestling to keep that lion away from that sheep. This is God and the children. This is Jesus and the people. 
This is the love that is over the house. This is the love that is over you and me. It's an integral love. It's a binding love. Friend, there is no power in this world more powerful than love. Nothing can come against it and overpower it. It is the ultimate annihilator. It is the softest, most delicate thing. It's everything. And this is God's love for the children. This is my Bible study for you all today. You know what I'm about to say. We love more than we'll ever know. The only reason I say we'll love, we're love more than we'll ever know is because the love is so deep. It goes so far. The root is so deep that it will take lifetimes of being activated, awakened to it, to really realize it. That's how much you loved. You're important. You matter. And don't ever for a second think that you are not. You are never alone. If you only knew who walk with you at all times, all times. I just come forward singing my song. Be good to yourselves and be good to each other. Peace and love.